Good morning, family. Good morning. Uh, first thing, when you look on your program and you see Anthony Hodge, Reverend, I want you to know that I am not him. Uh, there are significant similarities in size of head, eyeglasses, and height. My name is Edward Atkinson. He's, a, he's my pastor. And um, Ms. Sims asked me if I would like to introduce the Executive Secretary of Council of Bishops for the United Methodist Church, my friend Marcus Matthew. You know, if you notice, I limp a little bit just because I got this boot on my foot. But I said to myself, in that instant, I would have come in here on a gurney to introduce my friend. He's that important to me, he's that important to us, and as you heard our history, he's that important to the history of this great church. Amen. So I'll take a few moments and share a few snippets with you of his bi biography, but I would ask and invite you all to, in your spare time, go look it up, because we're going to be blessed by a great man today who God is blessed to, to do so many things. Now, one of the things he did before he became all of this, he was my childhood mate. And uh, we were in class together in school, and for the life of me, I could not dress Marcus. He would, every time I got a new piece of clothes to wear, here he came to school that next Monday morning with a whole different outfit. <laughs> and he had this favorite, I don't know if you remember this, but he had this cardigan sweater. And I didn't like cardigan. But he wore it. So I had to go get it. <laughs> the only way I could get one is I had to get on the road where he stayed. So, believe it or not, I got a party as well. But let me get to the business of the day and talk about this great man that's going to bring up the word for us today by the name of Marcus Matthews. I don't have to tell you he's from Swanson, I don't have to tell you that he graduated from South Carolina State University. And you might not even know that at some point in time, he used to work here at Cumberland, employed here uh, as a, a, one of the black community developers. And you know, that was, that, that was great work back in that day because that led us to where we are today. What I was, didn't, didn't know and never thought about in my life, he did. He ended up at Wesley Theological Seminary. Started a new course in his life. After becoming an assistant pastor for a couple of years, after graduating from Western, he served as the Jones Memorial United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C. He earned his doctorate in ministry from the New York Theological Seminary. He was the pastor of Ep Epworth Chapel United Methodist Church in Baltimore from 1982 to 1986. In 1986, though, he became the superintendent of the Baltimore East District, and in 1991 was named Council Director. You see this thing just keeps building up, though. It? it just keeps going. And it seems like he's, I, I don't know how Barbara got a lot of time, because he was really busy. If you had this bio that I have in my hand, this fellow right here was always doing something. Remember, Reverend Matthews was elected bishop in July of 2004 by the Northeastern District of the first, on the first ballot and was assigned to serve the Philadelphia Episcopal area. He retired as a residential district in August 31st, 19, uh, 2016. Mr. Matthews is currently the Executive Secretary for the Council of Bishops He's also serving as a bishop in residence at Western Theological Seminary. He is now the chair of the Board of Trustees of Acre University. As a matter of fact, I saw it on TV where he was doing a presentation over there just not too long ago over in Africa. And I, then I said, boy, he is still busy. Bishop Matthews was married to the former Barbara Walker Matthews. They have two children, Jamie and Marcy, five grandchildren. Another thing that I'm jealous of, so 
I don't have any markers, so I got to get a like that card and sweat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on this blessed day, God has allowed him to come back to the Son of Comfort. And after the selection from the choir, the voice you will hear then will be my friend, my classmate, and esteemed Bishop Marcus Matthews. <laughs> President Marcus, I promise you I will behave myself and follow your instructions. But certainly, I'm um, thankful to you for this gracious invitation, and um, I am also glad to see Reverend Cooper in the house um, today as well, one of my Facebook partners in Friday. <laughs> Let me um, also, just simply, um, she will um, get me for this, but uh, Barbara, would you stand? Um, my wife is with me. Um, I believe some of you have met her over the years. And also, other members of my family, if you would just stand where you are so that they can greet you as well. Um, members of the family, please. They are here from New York, Atlanta, Charlotte, um, and so they come from several places, and I'm thankful to God that we have had a chance to visit some during this week. Let me also say that I've been told that there are members of the class of 64 that are present, and um, could you stand so that um, I can see you? Um, now, I'm not calling names, so you just need to stand. <laughs> But we were just like you said, friends, and we could talk that way. And um, thank you to you for that kind of introduction, because I know there were some things you could have said. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me um, just ask if you would do one thing uh, for me um, while we're here today, um, because um, after um, we leave here. Uh, Barbara and I will be going back to Washington, and uh, by the grace of God, we'll be um, doing one of our bucket lists. On our bucket list, we have to go to Sydney, Australia, to do a 14-day cruise. And so, um, God has blessed us. It was one of the first things on our bucket list. I won't tell you the others. Because she's the one writing the bucket list. <laughs> but um, we will be blessed to do that. But I also want to leave here um, trying to remember all of these good moments. And part of that is uh, trying to remember um, the names of the persons who will be greeting, certainly after church. Now, certainly, um, my name is printed on the bulletin. <laughs> And so you don't have to even remember it. All you have to do is look down at your bulletin and you remember that Marcus is in the house. Now, some of you I have not seen for 50 years. Some of you I have seen since. I've been to several of the class reunions. So what would be helpful is that uh, don't give me a test. Don't walk up to me and say, now do you remember who I am? <laughs> So, you can help me by simply uh, saying who you are, and then we have a conversation. Amen? Amen. Thank you for that, brothers. But it is good to be here for this um, celebration, and um, I know God is blessing you in some very powerful ways, and I know God will continue to do that. One of the things that my wife taught me early on, and that was not to call names. And so I will not be calling names if I slip. Uh, Reverend Cooper, I'm going to just say it was uh, because the Spirit moved me. <laughs> and the Spirit got control of me. But I tend to stay away from names 
because I can easily call someone the wrong name and I will not do that. So um, I will follow my wife's um, counsel during this service. Won't you pray with me? Somebody many years ago prayed for me, kept me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad today that they prayed for me. My family, friends prayed for me, kept me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad that they prayed for me. Cumberland Church prayed for me. Kept me on all of your minds. Took the time to pray for me. I'm so glad to God this morning that this congregation took the time to pray for me. And so eternal God, as we gather here this morning, we know that there are many folk who are praying for Cumberland, praying for us at this very moment as we gather for worship. Persons praying for us that we will continue to be a strong church, praying for us that those who come in here with a broken spirit this morning might find healing, praying for us that those who may come here with other things on their minds that they need to let go of will let go. Praying, praying for us. Praying that Kamala, Kamala will continue to fulfill this calling in the world, in the spirit and power of Jesus Christ. And so now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. In 2000, Robert E. Quinn wrote a book entitled, Change the World. This is our theme today for this homecoming. This book shows how Ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And I'm talking about people who have been a part of this congregation. You ought to be proud, for this congregation has produced over its 152 years extraordinary people. You have produced over 23 ordained elders in the United Methodist Church serving all over the world. And for that, you ought to give God some praise right now. You don't produce good leaders in a church where nothing is going on, my friends. You don't produce good leadership in a church when the church is turned inward only on itself. But you have produced exceptional educators. I see them sitting all around here, principals, superintendents, persons who have given such good leadership, not just to this church, but to the Florence wider community, politicians, contractors, construction workers, doctors, health care providers, service workers, mothers who went without so that we could have a better life. Mothers who work around the clock so that we could be in a better position today. And there were fathers, all fathers are dead, be at least that I saw in this church. Men who took up what it meant to be a man and people who gave good leadership in this church. The central message of this book is that we can all change the world, but we must first change ourselves. <laughs> Michael Jackson's lyrics, Man in the Mirror, I think are appropriate for us this morning. He says, I'm starting with the man and women, I'll say man and women, in the mirror. 
I'm asking them to change his or her ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. You know, I think we are always so busy saying what somebody else needs to do and forgetting that we too need to apply what we're saying about the other person. You know, you can't tell children how to live if you yourself aren't living correctly. Amen. The historian has already said this, but can you imagine in 1865, Joseph and Sarah Kershaw starting this congregation? Can you imagine inviting people into their home to strategize, to plan, to look into the future. Not simply saying what they didn't have, but talking about what they wanted to make happen. Can you imagine? There they gathered in the yard under a bush arbor. Look at your neighbor and say, bush arbor. Bush arbor. Now, when I looked in the history book, I didn't know what Bush Harbor was. So I had to turn to my wife. <laughs> and she reminded me that we do have dictionaries. But anyway, uh, I was instructed to know that a Bush Harbor was where you could just take four poles and put them up and then have something on top, either bushes or cloth. And that's where we got started, friends. We weren't always like this. <laughs> this church got started under a bush arbor. And then in 1866, 1866, can you imagine with $195, and then $195 was a lot of money, friends. It was a whole lot of money. But they didn't wait on a campaign past a three-year campaign to raise $195. They did it in one year. They raised enough money to buy the property where we now exist. Can you imagine how risky that was during this period? Because during this period, you do remember that it was during the period in which 1865 that the 13th Amendment was eliminated, which dealt with slavery. Yeah. Slavery was put to rest in the year in which this church was started. <coughs> Can you imagine how risky that was for members of this church to do that at the very same time that year Abraham Lincoln was assassinated? And he was the one who we were looking toward to help us. But also, if you read the history books, the Ku Klux Klan was formed in that very same year. And so you can imagine how men and women trying to start a church downtown in Florence, as a matter of fact, not out somewhere here, but in the midst of all the activity. Can you imagine how risky that was? Can you imagine how their lives were being threatened and the pressures they must have been under during 1865? These original founders of Cumberland took a huge leap of faith. These founders made a way out of no way. And even though funds were often scarce and they had to live through some challenging times, they continued to have a faith that kept them moving forward. They trusted and believed in the power of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm sure that there were no doubters and naysayers among them. I'm sure because if that was true, they would not have done what they did and they would have not moved with the speed that they do. They did. And so, the good that they did 
they knew God would reward them. They understood that God was with them in helping to change the circumstances of their existence and even in changing the larger world around them. I don't know who did the artwork on these beautiful bulletins. But I want you just to look at it for a moment. The tree. The tree. If you notice the roots, Jesus. Friends, it is the roots that have to be solid. You have to, when you plant a plant, you have to make sure that you use enough fertilizer, that you water it, that you tender it, so that the roots get firmly planted in the ground. That top part is nice because it will probably produce some fruit, some flowers, something beautiful. But you can't have that part if the roots are not firmly planted. I thank God for the men and women of this church who nurtured persons like Ed and myself and others who are sitting in here this morning and helped us to get firmly rooted so that one day we too could blossom and be like the branches on these trees. The words of William McDowell states it clearly in I Won't Go Back. The words go like this, I won't go back, I've been changed, healed, freed, and delivered. I found joy, peace, grace, and favor. I won't go back, can't go back, to the way it used to be, before your presence came and changed me. When I was asked by Reverend Hodges to celebrate this time with you, I was honored, and I'm still honored, because this is a time when you look back at all the special moments that have taken place in this church, and remember many of the people who have first passed through these doors before they entered the gates of heaven. You are gathered here today to reminisce in the company of the saints who have gone before us, but also to remember that we are all past, present, and future an important part of God's family. And so no matter how we enter these doors, once we become a part of this fellowship, we are all important in God's eyesight. And so it matters now. One of the things I used to love about Cumberland back in the young days was that there were not only people, I thought at one point maybe everybody resided in West Falls. <laughs> but when you would come to Cumberland, there were people from East Forest, North Forest, South Forest. And we lived together as a family. We respected each other as a family. And we became close as a family. For our friends in the final analysis, we are the ones. We are the ones that God has put in this space. We are the ones that can make a difference in this world. We are the ones that can help people to change so that they can understand that there is a God who loves them just as well. And so the cloud of witnesses who have gone before us have already done their share to keep a rich family of God legacy alive in this place. Your legacy is not something of when you have gone on, but your legacy is how you live each moment of your life. Amen. Your legacy is how you will be reacting to people once the benediction is done today. Amen. Your legacy is how you live every single moment of your life. And so you have to be careful, my friends. You don't have the 
security of deciding that you're going to deal with your legacy after you get out to somebody or two years from now. You have to live your life correctly now because you're living your legacy every moment. Faith, for in faith, Moses' parents defied the government authorities in order to be obedient to a higher authority. When they hid Moses from those who would do him harm as an infant. And so they were rebelling against the establishment because they wanted to do not what man was telling them to do, but they wanted to do what God wanted them to do. And so scripture tells us, and in faith Moses refused to be identified with the oppressor in order to cast his lot with the oppressed. In faith Moses deemed the way of sacrifice and difficulty at the command of God to be of greater value than the material treasures that might have awaited him in Egypt. He could have had all that he wanted materialized, but for Moses, that was not enough. By faith, Moses instituted the first Passover traditions of his people so that they would always remember that God would be with them in their moments of crisis. So often we forget. We act like our lives only depend upon ourselves. And we forget that in moments of crisis, we need to turn to God. And by faith, Moses led the people to do the impossible, crossing over the Red Sea as if on dry land, when God commanded them to move forward. And so, come on, it is important for us as we celebrate 152 years that we continue to create sacred space here in this place so that people can be themselves. For as long as being oneself yields evidence of the same kind of faith of those ancestors in the spirit who have gone on before us, we all need to have a place where we can feel safe. We all need a place where we can come and feel comfortable and know that we are loved, that we are supported, and that there are people who are here that will take us in no matter what we do in life. So often we forget about those who sit around us and we just assume that all is well. Homecoming means my friends, coming home. I once saw a plaque which defined a home. It said, home is where you can still be silent and still be heard. Where people laugh with you about yourself. Where sorrow is divided and joy is multiplied. Where we share love and where we grow together. These 40 years of ministry for myself and for Barbara have really been um, a time in which um, I just give God thanks and praise for every moment that we share in active ministry. We have lived in eight different homes. Each we call our own home. We are no different from Reverend Hodges or Reverend Cooper and other ministers. We move from church to church in the United Methodist Church, ministry to ministry and house to house. J. Howard Payne describes it this way. Mid pleasures and places, no matter where we roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. 
You know, going to those eight different places meant that, you know, though I had grown accustomed to where we were, we just couldn't take what we were doing, our ideas, our cultures, into that other city. We had to go in and to adapt. We had to go in and adjust. We had to change. Because certainly you don't think that all of these people, because we came to town, <laughs> and so the, one of the blessings of ministry is that it always helped us to understand the value of changing, of being a person who is open to the Holy Spirit and open to what God might place before us. The story of Moses and the children of Israel is also our story of our lives. Who among us does not feel overwhelmed at times by the challenges that threaten to watch over us? My friends, black lives really do matter. Amen. Hashtag Charlottesville. Men who see women as objects because of their wealth and power cannot be tolerated, my friends. Amen. Terrorists killing people in mosques in Egypt, yeah. killings in many of our churches as people gather for prayer. Some of us struggle even with personal issues of health. Many of us waiting to go to the doctor, hoping to get a better result. Many of us worried about our health care, not knowing whether it's going to go up or whether it's going to go away. These are issues that we are confronted with daily. Finances, having enough to make ends meet. Many persons I have talked to are making decisions between whether this winter they can pay their heat bill or pay for their prescriptions for drugs. Families are torn all over. Families not able to find quality time to uh, be together. We are, my friends, living through some testing periods. A mother last week who is preparing for surgery on this coming Tuesday. In a conversation with me as she prepares for surgery, she said, you know, I just learned that my son has lost his job. <clears throat> we too, like Moses and the children of Israel, stand at the shore often with what feels like the Red Sea in front of us and Pharaoh's mighty army behind us. Our challenge on this homecoming, like Moses and the people of Israel who came before us, is whether we can muster the faith to move forward when God says it's time to move. Not backwards, not around, but forward and through our own Red Seas. Church, do you have the faith? Yes. Do you have the strength oh, yes. to move through today your own red sea? Yes. Or I am sure there are some who are saying, well, uh, Pastor, that doesn't affect me. Well, uh, maybe you're living in a different world than <laughs> There ought to be some people in here this morning who know what I'm talking about. There are so many people who I can name today from Cumberland that have gone on to glory, who did extraordinary things. The educational building that we are able to enjoy would not have been there if it wasn't for men who did that work and made that possible for us. All of these things that we see around us would not be possible if it was not for people who sacrificed beyond what they could do. They have done much for others, many of them, without even a thought about what 
what would be available for them. These saints were not out looking for fame and fortune, but were seeking only to do God's will by walking in faith and doing all they could to help others along the way. Cumberland, you still today have a proving ground right here in this community. So often, we go looking for diamonds in other places. We chase after various churches, hoping that it will be the right church. We chase after so many different things in life instead of realizing that the diamond that you're looking for might be right here in your own backyard. Thank God for coming. Because there are many what I call mom and pop churches that in these 152 years are no longer around. Many of these churches that pop up one month, two years later, you look, they are gone. But Cohen has held firm. And that is because you have been rooted the right way. And because you understand the God whom you serve, and that there are diamonds right here in Cumberland that we should be celebrating. You are already out in the field, and we thank God for it. I was sorry that Barbara and I didn't get here early enough on Tuesday, but I remember last year before Thanksgiving, getting here and coming to the service that you had for people from the community, of persons who, many of them were with our homes, many of them come here to get hot meals. And how that warmed our hearts last year. This year, unfortunately, our flight didn't get us here on time. But thank God, thanks be to God, that you take the time to do that. Thanks be to God that you see it important enough to try to minister to those who have far less than many of us sitting in all of this plushness this morning. Oh, I'm sure if the Kershaws could look upon us right now, they would be amazed to see how you've come so far in all of this comfort from the bush. We celebrate. We celebrate by acknowledging that we have been who we are. We celebrate because God has blessed us abundantly. There's an African saying which goes like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Progress is often slow, and the race is not always won by the swift. But the race is won by those who persevere to see what the end will be. So often we give up. We say that we don't have the membership that we did 50 years ago. So what? So often we give up. We say that we don't have the financial um, givings that we once had. So what? Be thankful for what God is giving you. Be thankful for what God is blessing you with. And take those blessings to be blessings to others. God is continuing to help come on, write new pages to write new chapters in life, unless we doubt today that we still have power to bring men and women to Christ, unless we doubt today that we still have the power to transform this neighborhood and our very communities, and if for some reason we still doubt whether or not in this changing era that we live in, that we as the church still have the power to change the world, 
Let us once again be reminded of what Jesus said in his closing verses of Matthew's Gospel. It is revealed that the disciples too doubted. The disciples, the ones that Jesus was closest to, the ones that Jesus called together to help make a difference in the world, they had doubt from moment to moment. But they did their very best to change the world, to be change makers. That is your challenge. That is your challenge for this homecoming. And so I close in the following words of the famous gospel artist, Mahalia Jackson. If I can help somebody as I travel alone, if I can help somebody with a word or soul, if I can help somebody from doing wrong, then my living shall not be a vain. Thanks be to God, so be it. Amen.